Over the past decade or so, the world around us has changed significantly. In 2011, 35% of people across the globe owned a smartphone. Today, that number is more than 80%. Computational power has expanded as a result of that shift. The phone you currently have in your pocket likely exceeds the computing speed of your desktop computer 10 years ago. And today, in 2021, we are able to realize the implementation of artificial intelligence that was only theoretically possible just 10 years ago. In this lecture, I'm going to go over what this huge shift means for the medical community, especially when it comes to detecting and diagnosing dementias such as Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body dementia. And don't worry, I'm going to keep everything accessible and easy to grasp for a general audience. But first, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Michael Kleiman, and I'm a data scientist and postdoctoral research fellow at the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health in the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. I received my doctorate in experimental psychology from Florida Atlantic University, where I learned how to combine my two passions of dementia research and artificial intelligence. Let's start off today by asking in general what artificial intelligence even is. And we'll begin answering that by trying to do something that used to be incredibly difficult, but now with AI is extremely easy. That would be trying to write a program that can look at a picture and try to identify whether it's a picture of a cat or not. If we're going to solve this problem like we used to, we would need to draw various shapes that together represent a cat. If the subject of the picture fits into the shape, then we could say that it's probably a cat. Let's take this picture. If we draw a circle for the head, triangles for the ears, another circle for the body, and a stick for the tail, then we could tell the computer that something that fits into this shape would be equal to a cat. However, this doesn't work in all circumstances. Sometimes we have a picture of a cat that doesn't fit into the shape we made, like this one. In this case, we need to specify a new shape that fits this picture of a cat. Other times, we have a picture that does fit into the shape we made, but that's not a cat. Maybe for this one we need to specify face shape, or maybe that cats don't have bushy tails. What about this picture? The head and the body are both there, but now they're not in the right orientation, so we'll have to draw a new shape. And this one? Another shape that doesn't match anything we've drawn before. How do you even draw this? You can easily see how tedious it can be to write this program. You would have to draw a new shape for almost every single picture, and you will need to manually make sure not only that each decision by the program is correct or not, but that it makes the correct choice in the future. The thing is, this strategy of writing simple if this, then that scripts works really well for very simple problems. Thermostats, no matter how smart yours claims it is, only turns the AC on either full blast or turns it completely off. Its action is driven by a single temperature reading. Vending machines and barcodes are also extremely simple. We can easily program them to perform a task, and we are confident that they will accurately complete that task every time. The difference between these and the earlier cat detection problem is that there are only so many states or situations that the program can be in. You can only select from the choices in the vending machine, so you don't need to program what happens if you tell the machine to do something else. If you press the button in an elevator, it knows to go to that floor. If the floor doesn't exist, there won't be a button for it. Once the problem becomes more complex, though, describing your way through stops working well. Every additional choice or option increasingly adds more and more time spent working on the problem. If you need to manually draw every possible image of a cat, the program will never be finished. And even if you're extremely diligent, there will always be unanticipated cases that fall through the cracks, causing the program to fail. In response to needing to write more and more complex programs, we set out to develop the first machine learning algorithms that, instead of being told what to do and how to act, were instead taught what to do, using examples. For example, instead of, 
if you see a cat but not a dog, say cat, we show the machine lots of examples of cats and lots of examples of dogs. And then we give it a good score when it identifies a cat after seeing a cat, but a bad score when it does so after seeing a dog. The machine then rewrites its internal algorithm to better fit the scores, and then it tries again and again and again. But wait, you may be asking yourself, I thought this course was about artificial intelligence, but now you're talking about machine learning. What even is machine learning? Well, you may be familiar with the term machine learning as something related to artificial intelligence. You may have even heard both of them used pretty much interchangeably. And for the most part, that's fine. Fundamentally, there is no difference. For the most part, in almost all cases, you can with no issue replace the term artificial intelligence with machine learning. Because nearly all of artificial intelligence, other than the science fiction AI from an Isaac Asimov book, is machine learning. Let me briefly explain what I mean using this picture. You can see that artificial intelligence encompasses machine learning, which then encompasses something called deep learning that I'll explain a bit more later. AI describes the basic concept of some kind of program that is able to act and adapt in some way. We first created the idea of artificial intelligence long before we had the ability to actually realize it. And so naturally, a lot of the earliest descriptions of AI were some type of artificial human or brain that basically acted like our brain does, through learning, sensing, reasoning, and adapting to its surroundings. Once we started to actually invent and develop AI algorithms in the real world, we learned that while our initial concepts were theoretically possible, we had to start from a place much, much simpler. And so, as a result, we started to use the term machine learning to better describe the type of algorithms that we were able to create. A machine that instead of being told what to do, instead learned through being shown what to do, like animals. Ideally, though, we aim to create machines that learn better than animals, giving them far more examples than any animal would be able to remember in a single training session, and performing the training far faster, too. But the real trick is that we don't need to train only one machine. Instead, we can train hundreds or even thousands of machines, all at the same time. To clarify, when I talk about a machine, I don't mean the computer itself. In this context, a machine is an algorithm or model that performs a task repeatedly that runs on your computer. For example, a machine gun is a gun that fires repeatedly using a specific series of machinery. A car is a machine because its engine, belts, and axles all work together to make it run. And so, when we make virtual machines, we build a model that is able to perform a specialized task over and over again, like a machine. To develop what we call a model, we first create lots of learning machines. For example, we can create four machines here that's, you know, one would be a square, one would be a triangle, we'll have a dark green square, a lighter green triangle, we'll make a yellow circle and a blue pentagon. Then we test these machines using our examples. In this case, let's say we're testing them using pictures of cats. You can see that the blue pentagon performed the best at 55%. The yellow circle was a little bit worse at 50%, still not bad. And then the other machines weren't that great. So next what we would do is we would put aside the best performing machines, the blue pentagon, and we would destroy the rest. They didn't perform as well, we don't need them anymore. For the next round, we would copy that best performing machine or machines and then modify them, modify them in some way. For example, uh, we would replicate the blue pentagon, but we would also maybe have a couple other colors of them. We'll have a, a purple one and a green one. Maybe we'll keep the color blue, but we'll change the shape a bit. We'll, we'll make it a, a hexagon this time and see how that works. Well, let's test it again, see what happens. It looks like the purple pentagon performed the best at 65%. Actually, changing the shape of it made it perform worse. So we would take the purple pentagon, replicate them, change the color, make some lighter, some darker. Maybe we'll change the size this time, It'd make one a little bit bigger. And then we would repeat that again, and again, and again, and again. Eventually, you end up with the single best machine or groups of machines that outperform everything else. 
likely beating out anything you could have manually programmed into the machine. Machine learning fundamentally works because we can do this process incredibly fast. Simple problems can be calculated in minutes or even seconds, where complex problems like pictures or video can take longer, like hours or days, but considering manually programming some of these problems was impossible before machine learning, it's an improvement regardless. More powerful hardware can reduce this compute time. And as this hardware is constantly getting better with every year, the types of problems that we are able to solve easily today would have been considerably more difficult to solve just five years ago. For example, self-driving cars are becoming more and more accurate and safer than ever before. 10 years ago, we had the ideas to create these cars using the same kinds of techniques, but our ability to actually create them was out of reach. Let's go back to the cat picture example. Current machine learning algorithms are able to not just identify a cat from a dog, but differentiate different cats from each other. This may not seem difficult if you have two distinct looking cats, like my two cats, this is Mochi and Taro by the way. A trained machine will be able to easily tell them apart even in a variety of poses, such as this one, or maybe even this one. But it becomes impressive when we realize that it can tell my black cat apart from this other black cat almost every time. In general, humans aren't that great at telling individual animals apart by their facial features, like we are with other humans, unless the animals are ones that we see constantly, like our pets. For example, many of you probably will have a difficult time telling these two cats apart, but I can easily tell that the one on the right is my cat Mochi, and the left is a random cat from Google. But the machine learning algorithm doesn't have our human biases. There are very slight differences in the faces of these two black cats, even if it's difficult to articulate them. And the algorithm targets these differences extremely effectively. Essentially, it's learned to become familiar with my cat faster than most people would, just from looking at pictures. So, I've briefly discussed AI and machine learning, but I haven't talked about the subtype deep learning yet. What makes it different? To boil it down to a single sentence, you can say that deep learning is just more complex machine learning. You could also say that if machine learning is a model of the concept of learning through examples, Deep learning is the biological model of how our brains actually learn. Machine learning was basically inaccessible to anyone other than researchers with access to supercomputer clusters until about 15 to 20 years ago. Deep learning, on the other hand, was completely inaccessible to almost anyone until about 10 years ago. Most of the really interesting and exciting applications of artificial intelligence use deep learning self-driving cars, speech detection like in Alexa and Google, and picture recognition like I described before. All of these require deep learning. This comic humorously describes an event that happened in the 60s, where a professor hired a group of undergraduate researchers to write a program that could easily identify objects in a picture. He thought that it could be done over a summer, using the same cat shape detector that I described earlier. The comic describes the task as virtually impossible, because at the time it was virtually impossible. It had been attempted hundreds of times since that project in the 60s, and always failed in some way. That is, until around 2009, when a researcher from Stanford University, Andrew Ng, realized that computer graphics processors were capable of performing the millions of calculations necessary to solve the task. By 2012, it was widely used in academic and research circles, including at Google, Facebook, and at many large universities. This comic was published in 2014. By this time, deep learning was possible, but still inaccessible to the majority of people, because only the most powerful processors could be used for deep learning. You could try in a home computer, but it could take you days or weeks to solve a single problem. That all changed around 2015 just a bit over five years ago. NVIDIA, one of the major producers of graphics processors for video games, started to focus on deep learning applications in their home computer graphics processors. Suddenly, 
truly powerful processors were available to anyone who wanted it, not just at universities or large corporate research labs. Almost overnight, the field of computer vision and AI exploded. It turned out that the computer parts that boost the performance of video games also happen to be really good at, at processing the huge number of calculations necessary for deep learning. And it makes sense. To play a video game that shows you a virtual world like this at 60 frames per second or even higher, that means that all of the 3D processing needs to be performed extremely quickly. Fortunately, the type of processing power needed to do this is also able to perform the calculations for deep learning nearly as fast as the dedicated processors in the supercomputer clusters at major universities. As soon as this was discovered, suddenly deep learning became accessible to anyone able to buy a $500 graphics card. Today, just a few short years later, deep learning is everywhere. Object recognition, not just in general, but in our pockets, we have self-driving cars, speech recognition that doesn't get thrown off if you don't speak perfect English and only English. But arguably the most beneficial application of AI is its use in medical research and clinical practice. In the same way that machine learning can easily tell two cats apart better than humans, it can also be used to find patterns in medical data that might otherwise be overlooked by experts. Radiology was one of the first big areas of medical research, following the deep learning boom. When you perform a scan of a body part, either from a broken bone, to a cancer screen, to a brain scan, you are left with thousands or even millions of data points, represented as a black and white image with nothing labeled. Naturally, a doctor that specializes in reading these scans needs to methodically go over each image and identify potential abnormalities. You can probably imagine that after a full day of hard work, devoting your concentration towards reading these scans can become more and more difficult. And it has been shown that physicians who are sleep deprived or distracted can miss points of interest. It's no surprise either. If you take a look at this scan of lung cancer, you can see the circle of abnormalities. To an untrained eye, they are indistinguishable from the rest of the image, of course not looking at the circles. But a radiologist or other specialist knows exactly what to look for. However, even being trained, it's still a very difficult task. That's why one of the first huge breakthroughs in medical applications of AI was being able to identify these types of abnormalities. We call the process of helping a physician by identifying possible abnormal areas computer-aided detection. Sometimes, Neurologists need to look at a brain scan and identify whether any particular region looks abnormal. Of course, this requires a lot of training, as the brain generally looks like a big gray blob in these brain scans. Fortunately, new AI algorithms allow us to automatically detect these regions and segment them into an easily readable format, like through color coding. This makes seeing any abnormalities in the brain scan trivial, whereas before it would have taken a fair amount of effort. It's also possible to treat scans like we treat cat photos and train a model to differentiate whole scans. If we show a model lots of pictures of brains with dementia and lots of healthy brains, we can train the model to learn the very small differences between them and automatically determine if it looks like a demented or a healthy brain. AI is able to automatically process text information and make decisions based on it in a similar way that Alexa or Siri or Google can make decisions based on the verbal information you provide by speaking to it. We call this technique natural language processing. IBM's Watson platform, probably most famous for beating human contestants on the show Jeopardy, works on a similar principle to Alexa or Siri, except that it is specifically tuned to access a huge amount of information that is most relevant to what it's being used for. On Jeopardy, it was given access to essentially the world's knowledge, and because of its AI programming, was able to access it and find the correct question to answers that are often worded in the form of puns or fit a particular category. In the medical field, 
Watson instead uses information in unstructured clinical notes from physical and cognitive exams, radiology reports, and elsewhere to help researchers place patients in ongoing clinical trials that they may be a good fit for, or to assist doctors in finding a diagnosis for their patient. This strategy of assisting doctors and physicians in finding the correct diagnosis based on medical data is known as clinical decision support. Because instead of making the decision itself that a patient has a diagnosis, it instead provides assistance to the physician to support their decision. We're at a point in time where AI is technically in its infancy, but it still has a lot of powerful and useful applications. Many physicians are justifiably wary about relying on the decision of an AI, especially if the algorithm it uses to arrive at a decision is so complex as to be uninterpretable, something we in the field call a black box algorithm. Instead, physicians are often a lot more comfortable using something to support their own conclusions, and the patients usually are as well. It is a lot easier to understand and thus come to terms with a diagnosis if it is based on five or six different tests than if it were based on a single algorithm that not even your doctor could interpret. And so, it is more common for your doctor to use the output from such a clinical decision support system to help them make a diagnosis based on other tests you have received. These types of techniques can be used to help scientists, specialist physicians, and even your own family doctor detect dementia. But in order to appreciate how AI is helping improve the way we detect cognitive impairment, we first need to discuss how do we even detect dementia in the first place. First of all, it's important to note that dementia is an umbrella term for a number of different disorders. While they all affect the brain, and thus cognitive functioning in some way, they each have different mechanisms and the type of cognitive functioning that is affected also differs considerably. The most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, making up roughly half of all dementia cases. Alzheimer's usually affects the parts of the brain that affect memory, although many other regions can be affected. A prominent marker of Alzheimer's pathology is a buildup of a type of protein called amyloid inside of the brain. And although we know very little about why it builds up and how it works, we do know that it can eventually lead to the neurons in our brain being destroyed which results in cognitive impairment. The second most common form of dementia is Lewy body dementia. This form of dementia is also affected by the buildup of a protein, this one called alpha-synuclein, into clumps called Lewy bodies. Lewy body dementia is closely associated with Parkinson's disease, and they often co-occur with one appearing before the other. Lewy body dementia can affect the regions of the brain similar to Alzheimer's disease, and so can sometimes appear similar, but they do diverge in that Alzheimer's disease is often not associated with things like hallucinations, sleep issues, or severe motor dysfunction, while Lewy body dementia sometimes is. Frontotemporal dementia affects the frontal and temporal lobes of our brains, although both regions are not always affected. The frontal lobe is associated with executive decision-making, attention, and impulse control. And so someone with neurodegeneration in this region are often described as having a different personality, as they typically become quick to anger and act irrationally and without regard for others. The temporal lobe is associated with language, emotions, and memory. And so neurodegeneration in this region can affect the ability to speak, write, and understand language, in addition to general memory and emotional dysfunction. Many other types of dementia also exist including vascular dementia, and even some reversible types not caused by neurodegeneration, such as hydrocephalus-induced dementia, or even depression. In order to detect dementia, it is vitally important to first determine that the cause of impairment is actually dementia, and not caused by something else. I mentioned in the previous slide that some other issues can be mistaken for dementia, including depression. And if these are the cause of the cognitive symptoms, then we want to make sure that we treat those first before we begin the sometimes lengthy process of diagnosing dementia. This can be done through physical and neurological exams, and sometimes using imaging scans and blood tests, or even psychological examinations. Next, we can run neuropsychological, cognitive, and physical functioning exams to determine the extent of any impairment. 
We can also look for biomarkers, such as high amyloid levels that can indicate Alzheimer's disease, or certain patterns of neurodegeneration on a brain scan that could indicate another form of dementia. Lifestyle and daily living information obtained from a good friend or family member can also be very useful in determining to what extent the impairment is affecting everyday life, and so can then help guide doctors towards a more accurate diagnosis. In many cases, obtaining a brain scan is one of the first steps towards detecting dementia. This is because brain scans can both rule out non-dementia causes of impairment, and, if dementia is suspected, can provide valuable information about the extent of the impairment, including what regions are affected and how much degeneration has occurred already. Some types can even measure the amounts of the proteins that cause either Alzheimer's or Lewy body dementia. We can also test blood and cerebrospinal fluid to measure these proteins, giving us a better picture of what might be causing a given patient's dementia-like symptoms. But typically the first kinds of tests that are administered even by your general practice physician, are tests that examine your current cognitive functioning. These include compound tests, such as the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or MOCA, that asks you to do simple tasks like drawing shapes, counting backwards, and remembering a few words. Sometimes, more detailed memory tests are used, such as the craft story or logical memory tests, that ask you to recall all of the details of a short story. It's also common for patients to be asked to bring a close friend or family member with them who can provide information on the patient's everyday functioning. They may be asked questions regarding how they think the patient's memory has changed over the past year, or if they've noticed any changes in how they perform daily tasks. It is also useful to ask the patient similar questions as well. After all, you know yourself the best, and a lot of insight can be gained from simple introspection. But while interpreting the results of those tests is not difficult by itself, it becomes more complicated when you want to consider the results of a dozen different tests, plus the patient's medical history, their comorbidities, and their current medications. For a specialist, this type of task is no problem. But to a general practice or family doctor, who does not have any specific training, it can be overwhelming. To alleviate this, it can be useful to implement a type of clinical decision support AI algorithm, like those I described earlier. While they have yet to be widely used, there are some that have been developed and are on the market today. One of them, PREDICT ND, the ND standing for neurodegeneration, is gaining traction in Europe, as it has been shown to be able to perform as well as a specialist while reducing healthcare costs by up to 20%. While AI can help doctors diagnose dementia, a potentially more useful application of AI is its ability to detect impairment sometimes years before noticeable symptoms develop. Based on neuropsychological exam scores obtained twice a year, some studies show that small changes in cognition can be detected up to four years in advance. Early detection is of course a boon for patients and their families, but it can also be highly useful for finding potential therapies for dementia as well. If we know that someone will develop dementia symptoms in the future, we can place these at-risk individuals into clinical trials to more accurately and efficiently test new drugs and treatments. Many studies have failed in the past because they tried to stop or reverse the effects of dementia. Neurodegeneration is usually irreversible, so these studies were doomed to fail from the start. Other studies test their treatments on large groups of healthy participants expecting that a percentage of them will likely develop dementia. The issue with this is that the percentage is often so low that even if the drug did work, it would be difficult to tell. But if we can target people who haven't yet started to degenerate, but we know will in the future, we have a much better shot at success. Some of the most effective methods of early detection use neuroimaging, from MRI or PET scans to visually compare a patient's brain to the brains of patients with dementia. Just like how AI can tell the difference between a cat and a dog, it is also very effective at telling an impaired brain apart from a normal brain, and thus figuring out whether a particular brain scan falls into one of those two categories. It is also able to differentiate between different types of dementia, such as Alzheimer's from Lewy body dementia, 
a technique that is possible but difficult by hand, but becomes trivial when we let deep learning do the work. Artificial intelligence is also helping us learn about new ways to detect dementia. If you think back to that example of how AI can discriminate between two similar looking cats, even if we can't articulate the differences ourselves, we can also use AI to help detect dementia using measurements that are difficult to analyze by hand, or that haven't even been discovered yet. Using AI, we can develop new ways to assess cognition, using things rarely used in clinical practice, like the complexity of words used in a sentence, or how people physically look at pictures. One of these new, interesting ways is to investigate how people walk and move. You can do this using portable sensors attached to the body, through video cameras, or even through a specialized mat on the floor. The particular rhythm that a person has when they walk is referred to as their gait, and they can tell a lot about how impaired an individual is. When neurodegeneration begins to occur, it can affect the motor regions of the brain in ways that are difficult to detect in everyday life. However, by analyzing gait, it is possible to detect this shift even in very mild cases. And it becomes even more accurate if you pair the gait analysis with other cognitive tests. If someone with cognitive impairment is asked to perform a simple task like counting backwards at the same time as walking, their speed and gait shift slightly compared to someone without cognitive impairment. We can use machine learning and artificial intelligence to pick up on this shift and use it to determine the presence of dementia. It's also possible to detect these shifts outside of a clinical environment. There is some ongoing research on using our cell phones or smartwatches to measure gait and movement in the real world. The data is a bit messier than if we collected it in a lab, but it's a lot easier and more accessible to more people. I've mentioned earlier the term natural language processing and how it can be used to both interpret medical notes and win television game shows. But it can also be used to analyze the speech patterns of dementia patients and help us easily measure how impaired they are. We've known for a while now that speech patterns become affected as dementia develops, but until very recently, there hasn't been an easy way to measure it in a standardized format. One of the most common speech tasks used in dementia screening is to ask a patient to describe everything that's going on in a picture, such as this one. For a normal person, it's simple to methodically go around the picture and describe each event one by one. For example, there's uh, children trying to get cookies from a cookie jar. Some of the cookies are on the floor, which the dog is eating. There's a man washing the dishes, but uh, he's letting the sink overflow. There's a woman outside mowing the lawn, but she's also mowing over some of the flowers in the garden. And there's a cat outside playing with some birds. But it's a bit more difficult, if you have cognitive impairment, to do this exact same task. Someone with impairment might skip over certain sections, either because they don't see them, or because they think they're not worth describing. Or, they might describe the same event multiple times. Occasionally, they will also describe things that aren't even in the picture, maybe because they misinterpreted something. The way the words are said are also useful for identifying impairment. An impaired person will use less complex words, and will pause more to search for words they're thinking of. Even more impaired people will pause more frequently before simple words than less impaired people. All of this requires a great deal of training on the part of the physician to keep track of everything said, from whether they missed a particular portion to the complexity of their speech. That's why this type of task is rarely used in research, and almost never in clinical practice, other than for testing severe language deficiency after strokes or other brain damage even though we know it's very useful at identifying the degree of cognitive impairment. That is, until very recently. With machine learning, we can very easily measure language complexity, the number of pauses, how many things they described, all of it much more easily than before. While there isn't yet any clinical implementation, the effectiveness of this task means it will likely be developed in the very near future. And that brings us to our final topic, gaze behavior. One of my personal favorites. It's often said that eyes are the windows to the soul, 
a saying that is meant to imply that you can learn a lot about someone just by looking at their eyes. Personally, I like to modify that phrase a bit and say that eyes are the windows to the mind. You can learn a lot about someone by paying attention to their eyes, and it all has to do with how people direct their attention while doing certain things. I can tell a lot about a person by just seeing how they look at a particular image on a computer screen. And I do this by using what's known as an eye tracker. This one kind of looks like a regular computer monitor, but if you notice that bar on the bottom, it's actually a high-powered camera that focuses on the eyes and takes infrared pictures up to a thousand times per second. Using this eye tracker, I can measure exactly where on a computer screen someone is looking. Also, how fast their eyes move, or how wide or narrow their pupils get. All of this can potentially tell us exactly how impaired a person is, and what kind of impairment they may have. One of the things we look at is called novelty preference. Ever since we were babies, we as humans have always been drawn to new things. If you show someone a picture that they've seen before, and a new picture side by side, they will reflexively look at the new picture almost every time. However, this breaks down if there's some kind of memory impairment, like in dementia. If I show a person this picture, and then a couple of minutes later show two images side by side like this, a healthy person will automatically look at the new image, and not as much at the old one. But in dementia, this reflex is diminished, because they aren't able to remember as clearly if they've seen the image or not. And all of this is relatively easy to measure. I just look at the percentage of time directed towards one image or the other. Another aspect that can be measured is the pattern of exploration. When shown a picture, someone with cognitive impairment might scan the image slower or more erratically, or they might stare at certain regions, whereas someone without impairment would quickly examine each part of the image and then move on to the next. We can also examine how people approach reading tasks. When shown a sentence, there's a relatively predictable pattern of how someone's eyes will move across the sentence and onto the next. Easy words like pronouns and articles are skipped over, and more important words are looked at for longer. In someone with dementia, however, the easy words are looked at far, for far longer, and important words to the story may be skipped over entirely. Basically, the lack of a regular pattern in dementia patients is a pattern that I can look for to help me detect the degree of impairment. Over the past few years, there have been a number of advancements in the medical application of this type of cognitive behavior, like using gaze behavior to detect concussions on the sidelines of NFL games, or using quick speech analysis on phones to triage for strokes before medical help arrives. And lately, we've been discovering that measuring multiple cognitive and behavioral components in a single test can produce even more accurate tests. My research at the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health, and in partnership with both Florida Atlantic University and my startup Psyche Diagnostics, combines both gaze and speech behavior to allow us to measure how impaired a particular person is. In my study, I examined verbal responses to questions like, Describe what is happening in this picture. And then I measure how someone looks at the picture using my eye tracking camera. All in all, the future is bright for medical research, thanks to the advancements in computer hardware that enable us to use machine learning and artificial intelligence. Thank you so much for your attention during this lecture. I hope I was able to explain this fairly complex topic in a way that was accessible. But if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me. If you send an email to mjkleiman at miami.edu with the phrase lecture question in the subject, I will do my best to respond as soon as possible, usually within 24 hours. If you're local to the South Florida area and you would like to inquire about participating in a healthy aging or dementia-focused research study, please send an email to healthybrain at miami.edu.